Hello, everyone. My name is Frances Kaplan, and I am the Director of Library and Collections at the California Historical Society. Welcome to our program, Bohemian San Francisco, where authors Jasmine Dasnick and Sherry Smith will discuss 1920s San Francisco and the role of nonfiction and historical fiction in telling the story of this era. Before we begin, I'd like, though, to mention that the California Historical Society was established in 1871, and we are celebrating our 150th anniversary this year. Although some of us are still working from home, CHS is headquartered in San Francisco in Ramatush Ohlone territory. At CHS, we acknowledge this fact, and we work to make California's rich, complicated, and diverse past a meaningful part of contemporary life. We do this through public programs such as this one, through our research library and collections, and by hosting exhibitions. We currently have two exhibits on view, San Francisco by photographer Minor White, and From the Gold Rush to the Earthquake. Our galleries at 678 Mission Street are open, so Thursday through Saturday you can come and visit us, and a virtual tour of the Minor White exhibit is available on our website. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we start the program. First, this program is being recorded, and the video will be available for viewing soon on our YouTube channel. You can also access that through our website. Um, we are delighted to be presenting this program though live and we'll be welcoming questions at the end. Please use the Q&A feature, which should be at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many questions as we can. And lastly, at the end of this program, you will receive a survey. This is voluntary, but we really encourage you to give us feedback as the information you provide helps us both to improve our programming and give us access to important grant funding. And now to our speakers. Jasmine Dasnick. Here she is. Hello, Jasmine. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Jasmine Dasnick is the New York Times bestselling author of The Bohemians, which was just published this year. Her debut novel, Song of a Caged Bird, a Captive Bird, I'm sorry, was a New York Times bestselling book review, editor's choice, and a Los Angeles Times bestseller. Dasnick is also the author of The Good Daughter, a memoir of my mother's hidden life. Her books have been published in 17 countries and her essays have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times, among others. Dasnick holds an MFA in fiction from Bennington College and a PhD in English from Princeton University. She is currently a professor of English and creative writing at the California College of the Arts. With us also tonight is Sherry Smith. Welcome, Sherry. Hello. Sherry Smith grew up in Northwest Indiana, yet the American West won her over as a, as a topic of historical study. She received her PhD at the University of Washington and has resided west of the Mississippi ever since. She is University Distinguished Professor of History at Southern Methodist University and has been honored with fellowships from the National Endowment of the Humanities to Fulbright Foundation and Yale University. Her award-winning books include Hippies, Indians, and the Fight for Red Power, and Reimagining Indians, Native Americans Through Anglo Eyes, 1880 to 1940. Smith's most recent book, Bohemian West, Free Love, Family, and Radicals in 20th Century America, was published by Heyday Books in 2020. Welcome Sherry and Jasmine, and thank you both very much again for being here tonight. Thank you. All right. Well, first off, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Thank you to the California Historical Society for hosting this talk. And thank you to Sherry Smith for inviting me to, uh, to join her this evening in a exploration of Bohemian San Francisco. I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes or so telling you stories and sharing pictures of San Francisco during the period I call the Bohemian Lost Years, Dorothea Lang's Bohemian Lost Years in San Francisco. And I hope to share with you what made some of the elements that made this such a riveting time in California history and such a fascinating place to write about in uh, historical fiction. The novel, The Bohemians, is centered on Dorothea Lange, but I also aim with this story to shed light on the circle of artists and photographers and writers and other 
creative folk who were such an integral part of Dorothea Lange's life once she came to California. And also to place them within the social and political and cultural context of early 20th century San Francisco. So when people think of Dorothea Lange, if they can put a name or a face or an image to her work at all, it is usually this image here. This is her iconic photograph, Migrant Mother, taken in 1936 during the height of the Depression. If they can conjure Lang at all, it's as this figure, alone, out on the road with her camera, a solitary figure. What's often overlooked, though, are the years that she spent in San Francisco prior to the Depression, when she worked as a portrait photographer at 540 Sutter Street, which is right near downtown San Francisco. These are lost years in that they're little known and little remembered by those who do know them. And yet it, it's funny because Lang herself believed that these were the years that she found herself. So the years that have been lost to us are the years that she referred to as the period of time when she found herself, in fact. And The Bohemians, my novel, is a story of that discovery. So this young woman, Dorothea Lang, said once, I found myself in San Francisco, which gets translated in Bohemians with this first um, utterance as she sees the city. San Francisco, the jewel city, Paris of the West, a place where everything, absolutely anything could happen and probably was happening at this very moment. A place you could disappear into if you dared. Here it was, here I was. And here's a young Dorothea Lang. At about the time that, um, that the novel opens, it's May 1918 when Bohemians opens and a 23-year-old woman named Dorothea Nutzhorn sets off on a round-the-world trip. She'd been working as an assistant in a Manhattan portrait studio, but then the, her boss shuttered the business and she was suddenly out of work. In a way, it was her lucky break because for years she'd been saving money to travel and now she could. She couldn't go where she wanted to, where so many other artists would wind up, and that's Europe, Paris specifically. Um, so instead, she decided to go west, um, aiming to go eventually to Mexico and then the Far East. She winds up getting marooned in San Francisco, which I'll tell you about a little bit more in a moment. So who is this Dorothea Nutzhorn? She was born in, 19, in 1895 in Hoboken, New Jersey. She was the daughter of first generation German immigrants to America. When she was seven years old, she fell ill with polio, a trauma that would mark her for the rest of her life, as would her father's abandonment of the family just a few years later. Dorothea Nutzhorn, seen here with her younger brother, Martin, was raised by a single mother and she was brought up to be practical, and she was. After high school, she apprenticed herself to various portrait photographers in New York City, and that formed the bulk of her training. She did not call herself an artist. By the time she got to San Francisco in 1918, though, two things had happened. She had been robbed of all of her money, true story, and she had renamed herself Dorothea Ling. So this is San Francisco as Dorothea Lange would have seen it. Of course, the, um, the, the beautiful uh, tower here of our ferry building would have greeted Dorothea Lange as she entered the city um, in 1918. Then as now, it was the city at the edge of the continent, a place of beauty, a place of promise, and a place of tragedy also. In May of 1918, the month that Dorothea Lange arrived, so soldiers were shipping out by the thousands from the West Coast and the Spanish flu had just begun its advance. The bright money days of the Jazz Age glimmered in the near distance. This was a time of possibility and it would be that for Dorothea Lange. But San Francisco was also a segregated city in which the Chinese, who had been so essential to building up California and the West, um, 
were forced to live within a 10 by 10 block radius. A few other pictures of San Francisco at this moment when Dorothea Lange arrives, a postcard from that very same place, the Ferry Building, downtown San Francisco. And here we have some of our um, probably still recognizable homes. This is North Beach, which you'll soon find out was, um, was the heart of Dorothea Lange's world in San Francisco. North Beach probably is the part of the city that still most resembles the, the lost bohemia of Dorothea Lange's youth. This is Telegraph Hill with no Coit Tower yet up there, but we've got the, uh, the cable cars coursing down the hill, and this place. This is called Montgomery Block, and it is at the center of the novel. It, it was the beating heart of Bohemia during Dorothea Lange's um, day in, in the early 20th century. It was a four-story four artist colony where the Transamerica Pyramid now stands. It was torn down in the 50s, but for the hundred or so years that it stood, it housed about 800 artists and writers, um, including Mark Twain, Diego Rivera, and Frida Kahlo. It stood at the crossroads of three worlds, North Beach, Chinatown, and the Financial District. The moment that I read about it in Dorothea Lange's biography, the excellent biography of her by Linda Gordon, I just fell in love with this place. It seemed like the stuff of fairy tales, an artist colony in the heart of the Financial District in San Francisco. When I was learning about this magnificent old building and its illustrious past inhabitants, I was astonished to learn that so many artists had made their homes and their art here at the same time. I tried to imagine, novelist that I am, the conversations that had taken place in Montgomery Block and the nearby streets of North Beach almost a hundred years earlier. Excuse me, I'm dodging the sun a little bit. Pardon me. I wanted to know what had drawn all these artists to the same place and what kinds of lives they had led in San Francisco. Was it just a coincidence that they'd all lived here or was there something about the city that spoke to all of them? And if so, had that something made its way into their work? So I went searching. I went searching at Montgomery Block and I went searching at Copa's and here are um, a generation of Bohemians, um, painters and writers they're, they know they're being photographed and they're hamming it up a little bit for the camera. They're, they have gathered in their favorite, their beloved spot, Copas, um, which was originally in Montgomery Block, in Monkey Block. The owner, Papa Copa, was known to let artists draw and paint for their supper. And they did, creating extraordinary murals on the walls of Copas restaurant. Another shot here, which actually shows some of these murals um, with, the, with the cheeky cats um, carousing up, uh, up top there and, um, and Enzo Coppa, the owner, down at the bottom by the bar. I also went looking for Dorothea Lange's first studio. So her studio was situated at 540 Sutter Street, and this is the brochure for it. This is part of the collection housed at the Oakland Museum of California. And the brochure reads, the camera is a means of expression. In portrait work, it can be a rare and wonderful medium. Let us have portrait photographs that are real and true and individual, valuable as likenesses, but conveying the spirit of the person, always. And then at the bottom, you have Dorothea Lange, number 540 Sutter Street, San Francisco. And you've got this photograph here um, showing the fountain in the courtyard of 540 Sutter Street. Here is the Samovar that, um, that was part of the allure of Dorothea Lange's studio. She and her assistant, who I'll talk about, created this really gorgeous setting that invited the creme de la creme into the studio. Part of the allure was in these kind of um, or almost oriental um, artifacts that they that they managed to to uh, to collect and bring into the studio. So here's the samovar that graced the studio at 540 Sutter Street, and here's an early early portrait. Um, photograph, an early portrait that Dorothea Lange took. When Dorothea Lange worked in San Francisco, she took 
portraits of the wealthy of the city. These were society, you know, the, the creme de la creme, as I said, of society. She once said, I was the person you came to if you had the money to come. And it might not it might not really accord with our vision of Dorothea Lange, but this is how she cut her teeth as a photographer. This is how she learned how to work closely with people to engender trust with her subjects. All of the skills that she'd bring to bear later when she took portraits out during the depression were honed at the studio at 540 Sutter Street. She didn't only take photographs of, um, of the creme de la creme, she also took pictures portraits of her artist friends. This is one of them, an actress friend of hers. Uh, if you're interested in these early portraits of Dorothea Langs, these also can be found on the website of the Oakland Museum of California. This is Dorothea Lang herself. It is pretty, it's pretty hard to see, but this is in fact Lang holding her camera at 540 Sutter Street as a very young woman, newly arrived. Now you may wonder who the other Bohemians are. Um, the title of my novel mentions them in the plural and you get to know them through Lang's story. The most important probably to her it was Maynard Dixon who becomes her first husband. When Dorothea Lang meets Maynard Dixon, he's already a very established artist, uh, land, a landscape painter in San Francisco. He's sometimes referred to as the King of Bohemia. And when they marry in 1920, it's alluded to as the marriage of the King and Queen of Bohemia. So here we've got uh, Maynard Dixon and a young Lang. There was a 20 year age difference between them. And at this time, Lang still was not calling herself an artist. She, she considered herself a tradeswoman. Um, and it was Maynard Dixon, who was the artist of the two. And here are a few shots of Maynard Dixon, this really fun caricature of him on the left. In the center, he's striding down, it looks like Montgomery Block, um, not too far from the building, Monkey Block. Looks like he's got a canvas under his left arm and at the right a uh, picture that I believe Lane took of him. This is a painting. Maynard Dixon's work is extraordinary if you don't know it. Um, he's considered one of the finest painters of the American West, and he is also the person who first introduces Dorothea Lang to the wilder California. So together they trek out to Marin County, to Mount Tamalpais, and further north um, because Maynard Dixon so loves the wild countryside outside of San Francisco. He considers it the real California. This is his studio, a, a photograph taken by Dorothea Lang. This is one of the few places you could still find um, in existence. This building here is in Jackson Square in the city. Monkey Block is no longer, but these buildings here, one of which housed Maynard Dixon's studio, is still, um, is still standing. And should you want to go looking for Bohemians or the ghosts of Bohemians, this might be a place to go. The other people, the other Bohemians that were so important to Lang when she first came to San Francisco were the women photographers she met here. San Francisco has always been a pretty welcoming place for artists, but it was a disaster of epic proportions that actually opened, um, opened the city, opened the doors to the city to women photographers. The earthquake and fires of 1906 devastated the artistic community. Many photographers, more established photographers, moved to Carmel, to Mexico. Um, some went um, as Arnold Gente, Dorothea Lang's own mentor, returned to New York sometime after the earthquake. And as catastrophic as this was, it was the, the earthquake of 1906 that um, kicked open the door for women photographers. This is, by the way, a, a picture, probably one of the most famous pictures of the earthquake taken by Dorothea Lange's mentor, Arnold Gente, in 1906. Gente, by the way, is also the source of some of the oldest, I believe the oldest photographs of old Chinatown before the 1906 earthquake and fires. Um, he took substantial, a substantial number of photographs in Chinatown. And Dorothea Lang would have known Chinatown through Arnold Gente, with whom she worked very closely in New York. 
some of the other Bohemians that figured prominently in these lost years in which Dorothea Lange actually found herself. This is Imogene Cunningham with her camera. During their time in San Francisco, women like Imogene Cunningham um, and others um, not only took groundbreaking pictures, but they initiated and sustained conversations um, and connections with one another. As each woman asked what kind of pictures she wanted to take, she was also asking what kind of woman she wanted to be. She was asking herself what kind of life she wanted to forge for herself. Before coming to California, Lang had dipped her toe into the world of art, into the art scene. But at that time, Alfred Stieglitz had quite a firm grip on the photography scene in, in New York. Lucky for Lang, when she gets to California, there's no figure like an Al Alfred Stieglitz um, with that kind of grip on the photography scene in California. What Lang finds instead are women like Imogene Cunningham, who are creating extraordinary work, work that in some way, some ways Lang will only attempt a decade later after meeting them. I'll show you just a few of Imogene Cunningham's images. This is a portrait she made of Frida Kahlo during Kahlo's first visit to the city in 1930. Imogene Cunningham also took, um, made gorgeous uh, portraits of the San Francisco sculptor Ruth Asawa. And here is another woman photographer who figures prominently in Bohemians. This is Consuelo Canaga. Consuelo Canaga, when Dorothea Lange meets her, is working for the San Francisco Chronicle, which made her, which would have made her one of the very early women uh, photojournalists. And when Dorothea Lange meets Consuelo Canaga in 1918, 1920, around that time, um, she's just bowled over. She says of Consuelo Canaga, that woman will go anywhere. There's no, there's no holding her back. She would go trek all over the city. She especially loved, um, she especially loved Chinatown and would trek out there with her friend, Lu Louise Wolf, who would later become, Louise Dahl, excuse me, who'd later become Louise Dahl Wolf, a very famous uh, fashion photographer. Consuelo Canaga took some extraordinary portraits of African-Americans. You have to understand that at this time in history, very few photographers were taking uh, photographs of people of color. And so this really put Consuela Kanaga at the foreground um, in, in broadening the scope of what we see, who we see and who we think worthy of, photographer and, of photography. And if you know Lang's work, you know that that becomes such a vital part of her documenting the world um, is, to, is to show us more than we thought we knew and could see. Another of Consuelo Canaga's portraits. And, and here we come to Chinatown, which is figures, um, figures significantly in Bohemians. And really it's through the character of Dorothea Lange's assistant. So in accounts of Dorothea Lange's life, there are somewhat, um, somewhat truncated allusions to a Chinese mission girl or the mission girl, uh, a young woman of Chinese descent who worked with Dorothea Lange closely in her studio at 540 Sutter Street. The information I had was pretty scant on this woman, but the collaboration between the two, a young Dorothea Lange and this young, this young Chinese, Chinese American woman captivated me. She had, the, the one piece of information I had about her was that she'd grown up in a mission home. And that's where I began my search for her. Now, just for a second, I wanted to talk about my approach to historical fiction. Um, I have a peculiar relationship to history. It's wonderful to be included tonight um, in a program by the historical California Historical Society. But I have a little bit of a um, complicated relationship with history. When I look back at history, I'm often looking for what's not there. I'm looking for nameless figures. I'm looking for gaps in the record. I'm looking for what's missing, what hasn't been written, what maybe can't be known at all except through the imagination. The character Caroline Lee, who I base 
by based on this fragment of a person in Dorothea Lange's biography springs from my imagination, not from the historical record. What I wanted to know about her simply didn't exist in the historical um, documents of that era. Mostly she was seen as someone undeserving as a story, uh, of a story. So who was she? Who might she have been? Because even though I'm forging her with, through my imagination, I'm still using certain elements from history, from, um, for, from documented sources. Photographs were some of the most useful records to me, as were um, the propaganda of the era. So these are both real campaign posters. In 1920, the senator from California campaign, Keep California White. And these were the campaign posters that would have been plastered around the city as Lang is making her way through the streets of San Francisco in 1920. Knowing that she had grown up in a mission home, I was able to do research into the two mission homes that then existed in California. The likeliest um, home would have been the Cameron House. And you see over here in the far distance, um, the Transamerica Pyramid, which just gives you a sense of the proximity of the Cameron House to, uh, to Monkey Block in North Beach. This is the intrepid uh, leader of the Cameron House, Donaldina Cameron, who's also a character in Bohemians. She was a formidable woman who gave shelter and refuge to some 3,000 girls, women, babies who were victims of the human trafficking that was then flourishing in the city. And so we come back to Lang, to that image of her um, sitting alone atop the car with her camera. Through the character of Caroline Lee and um, through looking at the, the very vexed racial politics of this era, I was able to draw a line between the Lang of the Lost Years and the Lang that we know from her later works in, during the Depression. The Lang that produced this photograph, and these photographs. Lang was under explicit directions to only photograph whites because it was believed that that would engender more sympathy for the kinds of federal programs her work was meant to support. She defied this continuously through her work. So though we don't know these pictures as well, um, she took many pictures of people of color. And these are actually notes written by Lang's own hand um, letting us know that all races serve the crops in California. Another Lang portrait taken during the Depression. And these are portraits, portraits, and they really are portraits, not just pictures of her work during the internment during World War II, when she went to work for the War Department. And another image from that time. Lang smuggled some of these pictures out because again, she was given explicit directions not to make trouble, but she did. Bringing a human face to an American tragedy. So three takeaways and I will be turning it over to Sherry Smith for the rest of the presentation. Three takeaways um, I have in, in my process of writing about Lang's lost bohemian years. First of all, too, too often women artists are seen as solitary geniuses. Lang and her work shouldn't be seen as uh, considered in just a vacuum. Her photographs are so much more than just that one picture that's come to stand for her migrant mother. Looking at her early work can show us that even in the most challenging times, those who we think of now as icons grappled with the same doubts and fears and trepidations that we might face in our own lives, and that genius can't fully emerge without community and connection. Second takeaway is that the 1920s were a remarkable period in San Francisco history. It was also a time of great contradiction. On the one hand, the city was booming and its citizens and artists were enjoying all kinds of prosperity that made the city, the envy of many other parts of America. 
on the one hand, the affluence of some San Franciscans who were in fact Lang's um, sitters at her portrait studio stood in stark contrast to the poverty of thousands of others, particularly the Chinese citizens of San Francisco. If we look behind the glitter of the 1920s that would and still does fascinate us, we would find a deeply divided city whose stories of alienation still resonate a hundred years later. And finally, a takeaway I took in writing the Bohemians and studying Ling's early period has to do with the relationship between history and storytelling. History and storytelling exist in a sometimes complex, um, sometimes tense relationship. In writing the Bohemians though, I was able to discover how gaps in the historical record can suggest new stories about the past. It can suggest also the ways that storytelling can help us change our present by a backward glance, a more, a fuller backward glance, if you will, that's brought, if you will, that's brought to us through storytelling. And also how a fresh look at the past or a historical era can teach us something new about the legacy we inherit from the people who came before and the legacy we're creating for the people who will come. Thank you so much for listening to me all this time. Um, I have put together a guide to Bohemian San Francisco. If you enjoyed these photographs, I have many more which you can find here in this guide to Bohemian San Francisco if you go to my website. And please also feel free to reach out to me if you're not able to ask a question or when it occurs to you later. Um, here also is my contact information and I understand the, the, the California Historical Society will be making some of this information available to everyone. Again, thank you so much and I look forward to Sherry's presentation now and our conversation in just a bit. Okay, thank you, Jasmine. That was wonderful. And thanks, uh, of course, to the California Historical Society and all of you who are joining us this evening. The Bohemians of my book, which is a nonfiction study of these two people, Charles Erskine Scott Wood and Sarah Bard Field, the Bohemians of my book overlapped with Dorothea Lang's time in San Francisco, and they had several important things in common with her. Although she wasn't an artist when she arrived, that is, who she ends up becoming uh, in the course of her time, of course, in California and the people with whom she hangs out. Um, she also had a willingness to experiment with uh, uh, relationships and love relationships. Um, and she also had an affinity, as it turns out, with the city's bohemian community. Dorothea had arrived in California in 1918 and gradually found herself, according to the novel, and I'm sure it's real life, uh, drawn into the, human, to the Bohemian community centered around the monkey block and uh, its artist colony. But she was new uh, to this kind of thing, but she grew into it. But Erskine, as he was called, and Sarah's connection with San Francisco's Bohemia and with elements of the larger world connected with Bohemianism in the United States was longer and deeper and perhaps more multi-layered than Dorothea's was, at least in 1918. Although some readers question whether Erskine and Sarah were really Bohemians, I think it is unquestionably true that they were Bohemians. The reason that there are some questions about them is that Erskine Wood was a former military man, army officer, who became a very successful lawyer who defended corporations in Portland, Oregon for much of his uh, adult life. Now, this does not sound like a Bohemian, but Erskine was doing all of that um, in order to support his family. But in his heart of hearts, he was really a poet. And um, so both Erskine and Sarah, I think, have Bohemian cred, uh, in part because although they had to live different lives sometimes, they, and they were not starving artists, they certainly saw themselves first and foremost as, as artists and poets uh, in particular. They also valued above all people, other literary people, 
writers, poets, painters, sculptors, musicians, uh, actors and actresses, theater people, and they surrounded themselves with artists of all kinds whenever possible. And they also used the money that Erskine had made, and he was quite a wealthy man, to support other Bohemians and other artists, buying their paintings, commissioning sculpture, and trying to establish a theater school in San Francisco, which I'll talk about a little bit in, in a few minutes. Another element of their life together, which I think is quite Bohemian, is that they practiced free love. They were both married to other people when they met, but they left their spouses to live together openly and honestly and without uh, the sanction of church or state in San Francisco. And they finally achieved this end to live together in 1918, the same year when um, Dorothea Lange comes to San Francisco. And finally, um, they were also advocates and activists for politically radical issues, the re politically radical issues of their time. Um, and they had a lot of connections with fellow radicals in places like Greenwich Village in New York City. They maintained friendships and political and literary collaborations with many of these better known early 20th century Bohemians, including Max Eastman, Jack Reed, Louise Bryant, and so on. And then in the end, I think uh, it's fair to say uh, that they considered themselves Bohemians. They used that word when they described themselves at times. And so I'm, I'm definitely ready to give them a, a place in the story of Bohemian West and Bohemian San Francisco. Now their early lives gave no indication of this eventual development and affinity. Uh, Sarah Bard Field was born in 1882, I think about 10 years before um, Dorothea was. She was born in the Midwest. She was the daughter of a very strict Baptist father. And by age 18, right out of high school, she married a Baptist minister who was 13 years older than she was. And then she became a mother not long after that. But by the time she met CES Wood in Portland, Oregon in 1910, she discovered who she really was. And among the things she really was, was a, a socialist, a feminist, a poet, and a very unhappily married woman. I love these two photographs next to each other because the one on the left is, is one of the, I think it's the very first photograph that Sarah gave to Erskine as a gift. And as you might be able to read, she wrote librarily, uh, librarily yours, I think it says. My apologies to the librarians in the audience, but uh, I, I think what you see here is a very buttoned up, rather tightly wound uh, young woman who uh, was going to transform into quite a different person just a few years later uh, as she had left her husband and moved into the new world of bohemianism and political radicalism that she joined in part under the direction and support of, of Erskine. So in the, the picture on the right, you can see she sort of let her hair down a little bit. She's much more relaxed. The, the edges are much softer. And so I think these two uh, pictures side by side demonstrate the change that she went rather rapidly actually in the 1910s. And this uh, was by the way happening in Portland, not quite yet in San Francisco. Uh, Erskine was 30 years older than Sarah. He was the son of a very strict naval officer who made his son go to West Point. Erskine, as a young man, wanted a literary life. He knew that from the beginning of his young adulthood that he really thought he was meant to be a writer and a poet. <clears throat> but his father insisted that he go to West Point and so he did. He graduated, he became an army officer and he went to war against Native American people including participating in the Nez Perce War. But his diaries and his commentary even at that time during that war reveal amazingly modern sympathies toward the enemy. And at the end of the campaign, he befriended Chief Joseph and he um, uh, became friends with Joseph and began to advocate on the part of the Nez Pierce efforts to return to their homeland, which nobody was ever successful in achieving. Eventually he sent his son, not to West Point, but to live with Chief Joseph for several summers. So that gives you some idea of who he was and, and uh, who he was becoming. While he was in the army, he was sent to Columbia to become to, 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 to law school. And so he became a lawyer. And while in New York, he wasn't hanging around with the other law students. He found the Bohemians of New York City. And particularly at this stage of his life, he was particularly drawn to, to artists. 
And so among the artists that he became close and lifelong friends with from these early years in New York City were Child Hassam and Olin Warner and J. Alden Weir. These were his people. But he had married a Southern Belle. They began to have children. So um, as a responsible father and husband, he um, went, took the family out to Oregon, which he'd quite enjoyed when he had been there in the army. And he took on the role of being a, a lawyer. By middle age, Erskine was openly rebelling against this life. He was publishing essays that, that criticized capitalism, exploitation of labor, imperialism, war, and eventually marriage. He was a self-described philosophical anarchist. He wasn't a bomb-throwing anarchist. He wanted to achieve anarchism through peaceful means. He wasn't really a socialist. He was, he was a libertarian, but of a left-leaning sort of uh, stripe. He also was an advocate and practitioner of free love, even though he remained married. And he remained married because his wife refused to uh, accept divorce. He defended in newspapers and the courts anarchist Emma Goldman, who was a friend and a fellow traveler in the world of anarchists, and also birth control advocate Margaret Sanger's right to speak and disseminate information on birth control when she came through Portland. And through all of this, you know, defending these capitalists, raising children, uh, writing all of these uh, uh, tracts about politics, he also wrote poetry whenever he could. And through all of this, he longed for the freedom to be his true authentic self. So here we have him as an army officer on the right uh, when he finally gets to San Francisco and can begin that authentic self and that authentic life. Erskine and Sarah met <clears throat> in 1910 when Clarence Darrow came to Portland. And I don't know where Wood and Clarence's lives intersected, but I think clearly in the law and in their shared progressive and left-leaning politics. And Darrow knew Sarah because Sarah's sister, Mary Fields, who was a journalist and a social worker in Chicago, had been one of Darrow's mistresses. So when Sarah and her then Baptist minister husband came to Portland, um, Darrow said, you know, there's a person there I think you'd really like to meet. And he knew that both Sarah and Erskine were not very happy. And so he thought they could become good friends and the things that would bring them together would be politics and poetry. And he was right. But they also, not long after meeting, became more than friends. They became lovers. An affair that began in 1911. And as I noted, it took about seven years before Erskine was finally able to extricate himself from Portland, to leave his law firm, uh, to leave his wife and family with robust trust funds that he had earned through his law practice to make sure that they were well taken care of. And finally, in 1918, he joined Sarah in San Francisco. Now, Sarah had left uh, Oregon by the end of 1912. She uh, got a divorce from her husband. It was extremely painful and difficult and drawn out. Uh, she was hoping that she would at least have some custody of the children, but that likelihood was quite dim. And in fact, uh, when she did achieve the divorce, uh, she lost custody of her children, which was quite a heartbreak. But she moved to San Francisco and she was living there in 1914-1915 uh, and uh, she had to uh, wait for Erskine to show up so she had to keep busy some way and one of the ways she kept busy was by editing his poetry hoping for future publication but she also became very involved in the women's suffrage movement something she started to do when she was still in Oregon stumping the state in 1912 for the state enfranchisement of women uh, they had had several efforts before which had failed, but finally in 1912, the men of Oregon uh, voted to enfranchise women, and Sarah had been a big part of stumping the state to uh, achieve that goal. When she went down to San Francisco, she connected with other women suffragists, and in 1915, we had a job at the Panama Pacific Exposition at a booth that was created by the Congressional Union, um, which became the Women's Party. And one of the things they were trying to accomplish there was to exercise the women's potential to really make a difference in um, national elections. And both Oregon, California, other Western states had enfranchised women. So the idea was let's use the power of women voters to force the nation to uh, institute a federal amendment to the Constitution to make a women's suffrage a national 
uh, sort of phenomenon. So they had in this booth a huge petition where they were asking women voters as well as men voters to sign and ask and demand, in fact, that Congress create uh, an amendment to the Constitution supporting women's suffrage. So Sarah was very active in that. She's the woman on the left here. Uh, and then the question was, well, what do we do with the petition? And Alice Paul of the Women's Party idea was, well, we drive it across the country and we deliver it uh, to Congress. And while we're there, let's talk to President Wilson. So Sarah Bartfield and Ingeborg Kinstead and Mary, Maria Lindbergh, the two, the women on the center and on the right who owned this car, drove this automobile from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. in 1915. And along the way, they became celebrities, Sarah in particular, because she was really the voice of suffrage. And this was uh, quite an important event in her life and made her something of a national figure. But it was when Erskine moved down to San Francisco in 1918 that their engagement with the city's bohemian element suddenly quickened. Now, as I've said before, Erskine had lots of great contacts with the Greenwich Village Bohemians, and he kept those, uh, those friendships and those relationships alive, partly because he was often going back east on business. And also Sarah, uh, when she would go east on suffrage business, got to know these people as well. But it was in San Francisco, that was the place where they would finally live their authentic lives together as Bohemians and as free lovers. They didn't completely forsake their political activism, but their goal was to make poetry the center of their lives. So they were older, especially Erskine, uh, than Dorothea, and they were more established as Bohemian types. They didn't lead or help create the Bohemian circle of San Francisco. They rather attached themselves to it. They frequented the Bohemian haunts where Dorothea Lang uh, hung, out, hung out, including Copa's restaurant in Chinatown, but they did not live in the monkey block. Rather, Erskine bought a lovely home near the top of Russian Hill at the intersection of Broadway and Taylor Streets that is still there to this day. It was also the same street where Ina Kubrith uh, had a home, but as far as I can tell, it doesn't make any sense to me that they did not cross paths. I mean, they must have, but I didn't find any documentation of uh, a relationship with her, who was so clearly connected to a Bohemia of, of uh, late 19th and early 20th century San Francisco. But nevertheless, their home became a very popular gathering place for the artists and writers that um, Sarah and Erskine either knew or they wanted to know. And they created an atmosphere of lively conversation, great food, poetry reading, dramatic presentations, and support uh, for one another. As one writer put it, their doorbell, their doorbell had been worn green from the thumbs that pushed it. And as Sarah put it, a glittering array of people found their way to the flowering wall as, their name, as they named their home. And I'm so sorry I don't have a photograph of it because it's a, a, actually a very lovely uh, home. Among the people who came to their home, and it was, it was sort of a very informal uh, weekly salon, but people were coming all the time. But among uh, the, the people whose names will mean something to San Franciscans and people who are interested in California history included George Sterling. They thought that his poetry about California was beautiful and that his life had a certain dashing romance, which one would associate with bohemianism. Sarah noted that he was a bounder, always falling in love with some young, beautiful woman, especially if she was a, a poet. And um, Sarah went on to say, though, that it was his sweet and appealing nature that led everyone to forgive him, although I'm not sure his wife did. Uh, he was extremely generous to other poets. He um, would bring, for instance, he brought uh, Robinson Jeffers to the attention of Sarah and Erskine. They had not heard of him before George Sterling brought one of his books to them. And they uh, really liked him because he he uh, did everything he could for other poets. He thought, Ther he thought that Robinson Jeffers was the greatest poet that California had produced, and he did everything he could to promote him to magazines and, and newspapers. Sarah also thought that there was a sadness about Sterling, a sense of dissatisfaction, something was missing in his life, uh, a sense of fatalism. So she was not surprised when he took his own life. Another person in that circle included um, a woman named Genevieve Taggart, who is not as well known, I don't think, but still was, was on the way up in terms of fame at the time when they met her. She lived across the street. 
And in the early days of her career, they would have very long conversations about how poetry might be of service to human needs beyond the aesthetic. Both Erskine and Genevieve were interested in bringing poetry and politics together without harming poetic virtues. Uh, she was a socialist, eventually became a communist, um, and, and Sarah and Erskine sort of drifted away from her as she moved east, and um, they did not follow her down the road to communism. But they were really very good friends, and Taggart uh, named her first child, her first child middle name, after Sarah. They befriended sculptors, Benny Bufano and Ralph Stackpole among them. Sarah described Bufano when they first met him, uh, well, she, they met when he was still a very young man, just getting started, but she described him as perhaps the most impressive and later disturbing person that entered weekly into our lives. She couldn't remember how he came into their lives. She just thought he just appeared on their doorstep one day, which is quite possible, um, with his soft gray Italian eyes and a gentle manner and a quiet voice. Uh, he was so poor. Uh, and they could see that he had great potential. So Sarah and Erskine actually offered him a space in their home to use as a studio. They so believed in his gifts. And they also sponsored a trip to China for him so he could study uh, Chinese glazes. He remained, however, very secretive about his personal life. And when they found out that he had a wife, they upbraided him for not bringing her into their circle, not bringing her to their home so they could uh, embrace her. Uh, but he was angry with them uh, for even mentioning this wife. He said it was none of their business. And that was just a, an early indication that he could be a rather prickly character. Eventually, they commissioned several Bufano pieces for uh, another home they built down south of, in the peninsula, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And the relationship eventually deteriorated, lawsuit between them, and they became estranged. In the world of theater, Sarah and Erskine helped establish a theater, a drama school, along with Maurice Brown and Ellen Van Volkenberg. Brown had founded the Chicago Little Theater in 1912, and he was considered a vital force in the, avant, in the spread of avant-garde the theater after that. So Erskine and, and Brown shared a great appreciation of Greek drama, and Erskine absolutely loved his friend's defiance of conventional taste when it came to um, drama. And so he promised that he would do everything he could to help find the money to establish a drama school, one that would explore and promote commedia dell'arte, as well as improvisation among the new ideas that were circulating in, in that world of the theater. They um, hoped to support a, a puppet theater and uh, Greek plays and to establish a children's theater while also providing instruction and in acting and playwriting and lighting and costuming and all the things that go to make a theatrical production. They did manage to get started. They put on several productions, including a one-act play of Erskine's called Odysseus, but the school and the theater never gained secure financial foothold. And uh, Erskine and Sarah blamed the more conservative patrons of the arts of San Francisco who just really were not ready for this kind of theater yet. There are many other Bohemians uh, who found their way up to Russian Hill, um, but let me just mention one last person who was a very good friend of Sarah and Erskine's and that was Albert Bender. He was a very energetic patron of the arts in San Francisco and he was the one who introduced the couple to Ansel Adams. Uh, Adams later became a very good friend and when Sarah's daughter married in 1929, Adams was the wedding photographer. As for Dorothea Lange, um, you know, I'm sure their na her name came up and maybe they even met. But once again, sadly, when you have to stick to the record that you can find, I found no documentation in their papers that they ever met Dorothea Lange. Uh, they may have, but I just can't prove that that was the case. Although Sarah and Erskine, oh, I forgot to put this picture up. This is a photo, I think it's the first portrait of them together, which they took uh, when Erskine uh, finally joined her in San Francisco. Although they loved their friends and they were natural, wonderful hosts, they began to feel satisfaction um, because they couldn't get their own work done. People were always showing up at their house. Their home in Russian Hill was simply too accessible to San Francisco's artists and Bohemians. And so they decided to move. 
down to the Los Gatos area. And in 1925, they built this house. The picture on the upper right shows it, the back of the house. That's a huge piece of sculpture done by Ralph Stackpole. And the fountain in the front, Benny Bufano did for them. Um, many of you have probably been on the road between uh, Los Gatos and Santa Cruz and have perhaps noticed these two stone cats at this, at the conjunction of this little dirt road that goes up the hill and the highway. Well, this was the entrance to the home that Sarah and Erskine built, which they call the cats. On their calling card, on their personal stationery, they put where they were now living, but they put also the notice come by invitation only. And they also constructed a little studio up the hill from this large home where among the trees, even if people came and just showed up on, you know, without an invitation, they wouldn't know where they were so that they could hide and write in peace. And between these by invitation only warnings and the, the studio up the hill, this turned out to be the thing that worked. They were both able to really sit down, have quiet time to reflect and to improve or to write new poetry. And they both published volumes of poetry in the 20s and 30s, and Erskine's some satirical essays, which was um, called Heavenly Discourse, which was his most successful publication, went through multiple editions, and I think you can still find it today. They didn't forsake their San Francisco Bohemian friends altogether. They, people would find their way down. And they also made new friends in the Los Gatos Carmel area, including Robinson and Una Jeffers, although I think Robinson maybe came twice to the house. Um, he was not particularly interested in parties and soirees and so forth. John and Carol Steinbeck uh, also lived nearby for a while and were friends with uh, Sarah and Erskine. And I also want to mention William Rose Benet. He was not a Californian, but he was a poet and he absolutely loved Sarah and Erskine and immortalized them in some of his own poetry. Nevertheless, it's true that by the mid 20s on, they were no longer in the thick of Bohemian San Francisco. Those days were behind them. They weren't forgotten in San Francisco, however. Um, and in 1929, I just want to end by reading this little piece from a column that John D. Berry published in the uh, San Francisco News about Sarah and Erskine. He saw them walking down the street, and this is what he wrote about them. Today, I saw them walking serenely along the street. I said to myself, it would be impossible to think of them in a hurry. They always suggest that they are living in eternity. They were a striking looking pair. He gave the impression of amplitude, not because of any heaviness, but through being built on broad lines. His mild, kindly face with color that suggested youth was framed in thick white hair, somewhat longer than convention decreed and in a white beard discreetly trimmed. He had the air of being very much at home in the world, of being intimately related to the elemental forces. She was smaller and younger, with a face of extraordinary sweetness and with a, and, uh, with a light in her eyes that seemed to reflect an inner glow. She's even lovelier than she was when I first knew her, I thought, and I marveled at the qualities that enabled her to triumph over time what lessons she was unconsciously offering the followers of the beauty doctors with their concerns for mere externals. She could show them that the secret of beauty was a profound thing and came from the very essence of being. They didn't happen to notice me on the other side of the street, and I rather enjoyed letting them pass without holding them up. For the moment, I surely couldn't add to their felicity, but somehow, just from observing them, I felt better and I walked with a step that was a little more elastic. It was as if they made me recognize that in spite of certain shortcomings, we were living in a pretty fine world. And I think that is the one thing they did for their Bohemian friends in San Francisco, reminded them that they did share a pretty fine world. Okay, so now Jasmine will come back. So Jasmine, um, we're going to talk to each other a little bit and then see if we have some things from the audience. Uh, the thing, of course, that interests me so much is what you said about the limitations of 
the historical record. Mm -hmm. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. And then I will tell you my own uh, experiences with the limitations of the record. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for that excellent presentation. And I probably could talk to you for hours, but <laughs> briefly, uh, I, I have a real fascination with history. But like I said, I'm often, I'm often disturbed or, you know, definitely frustrated by the limits of what historians can tell us about the past. Um, I am, by training, I'm a literary scholar, and then by practice, I'm a novelist. So what I do is I, I work closely off the record, but it's in a way, I mean, particularly when you're writing about people of color, which is the main focus of my work. Um, all three of my books are about um, women whose lives have been obscured to us. Um, I think that imagination can be such an important vehicle um, to, in a sense, rehabilitating and restoring a kind of justice to those who have been written out of the record. So I, I confessed I have a little bit of a, you know, I feel a little bit like an interloper here, but I couldn't do what I do without the work of historians. But if I were satisfied with that work, I wouldn't do the work that I do. <laughs> right. Well, you know, um, one of the great disappointments to me was the absence of any discussion in the many, many letters and things they wrote about issues of race. Mm. Uh, occasionally I would find a mention and sometimes it did not reflect well on them. And what I concluded was that in their world, these issues of race did not seem important to them or they were not engaged in them. Obviously they were important to a lot of other people but not to this particular couple and the people with whom they interacted and engaged in political activity. They were super involved in labor issues and free speech and women's suffrage and world peace and anti-imperialism. There are all these other issues that they were very much engaged with, but not issues related to race. And so I see that as a, as a, a sort of a gap um, in the book because this is of tremendous importance, particularly to us now. But this was something I just didn't know. I didn't have the space, frankly. I had to cut so much of my context out as it was on those issues that, that they wrote about and engaged with. But I didn't have the space to even, um, other than occasionally note that they were not involved in these sorts of concerns and considerations. So this is a problem uh, I think that historians can have because uh, we're, we're you're not, you know, anyway, yeah. So we need both, we need, we need novelists to come along and fill in the gaps, as you put it. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel really grateful that I can depart and I can, um, I can sort of step into the moment in a way the historian can. And I think that's also something that I appreciate about fiction. E.L. Doctor has that great phrase, he says, um, the historian can tell you what happened, but the novelist can tell you what it felt like for that to happen. <laughs> So you yeah. can sort of, with your fiction, kind of teleport yourself into a moment that is probably not anywhere a respectable historian <laughs> will let themselves go. Yeah, and in this project, I was incredibly lucky because these two people wrote over 2,000 letters to each other. They were apart so much that the relationship became almost one that was solely one of letters. And they're pouring out their emotions <laughs> and their feelings and their angers. And, you know, I know when they're lying, when they're telling the truth. This was an unusual uh, reason, I mean, a, an unusual sort of archive. And that's yeah. really, really what drew, drew me to the story because for once we, I had a tremendous amount of information right. about what was going on. And not only with one another, but also with their spouses and with their children and their friends. And so, yeah, it was really an unusual opportunity that gave me a chance to sort of write a narrative that I'm always happy when I read a review that says this reads like a novel. <laughs> so so I, but I, I still wish, I know there's some things that are just not in there that um, I wish were. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, we should see if Frances wants to join us and. Hi, and she appears. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, before the, before the Q and A uh, overflows. So I hope you guys are both both ready for this. I'm actually going to start with a question that came that came first, but I think it's quite an interesting one. And Sherry, you actually went into this a little bit, but how do you both define bohemian? Or the term bohemian? And um, do you want me to go first? Uh, 
I'll be yeah, interested I mean, in what you say. It's a, I, I think it is a fluid concept, mm -hmm. but uh, it's people who see themselves as outside the mainstream and are conscious about that. Mm -hmm. And it can take various sort of levels. It can be about intimacy, about love relationships. It can be about political world. It can be about um, art and artistry, but I think people who are sort of counter the mainstream culture and consciously so. Mm -hmm. And we do tend to think of Bohemians as living in community. Um, mm -hmm. and so for me, uh, as I said at my beginning, the reason Erskine and Sarah to me are definitely Bohemians is because of their artistic uh, and poetic in, in, uh, in inclinations, uh, being advocates of free love, being advocates of radical politics and being in community uh, with those people. Those were for me what made them Bohemians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think fluid is a very apt word for bohemian. I might say it's also a little bit of a promiscuous term. It attaches itself to, you know, all different kinds of communities through history. We've had um, many groups of people who would call themselves bohemians, many groups of people who have been called bohemians. At the moment that I'm writing about, there are at least there are at least three very prominent bohemias in, um, in America. One is in New York City in Greenwich Village. Um, another one is, is just a sort of burgeoning bohemia in, um, in uh, Los Angeles around the film community. And then we've got the San Francisco bohemia, which would be, I think I saw the comment, um, there had been a preceding generation of bohemians in San Francisco that included Twain. Um, my bohemians would be, the next generation, and um, and so you see how it sort of slinks through the, his, the you know the historical timeline and attaches itself to um, different periods, different places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and actually speaking of that, when you say different places, one of the questions that said, uh, which is about Dorothea Lang, is did Lang did you ever come across anything where she talked about her choice of coming to San Francisco versus to going to New York or Paris, which was of course also a big center, and what did she do by coming west rather than following so many expats who went to, did go to Paris? I love this question because that's part of what made her so interesting to me. Uh, she had actually started out in New York. She worked in Manhattan where I was talking a bit about how that was a pretty closed circle for photographers. Now she wasn't aiming to be an art photographer at that time, but the, the boundaries were fixed in a way they weren't in San Francisco. Anyway, she didn't mean to stay here. She got robbed when she came to San Francisco. And it's really just entirely by chance, by bad luck, that she winds up, um, at least in the beginning, uh, staying in San Francisco. And then California becomes so important to her. She has a real, you know, sense of political artistic awakening when she comes to San Francisco, when she is, you know, circulating with these different personalities. Through Maynard Dixon, she's also getting to know the rural parts of the state. She's getting a feeling for the countryside, for, for the land. Um, and all of these themes um, then become expressed in the work that we know well, but we don't often think where it comes from. It came from San Francisco by accident, to our good, for, to our good fortune. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with this one too, this question, I don't think I was the only person clearly that was struck by the photo that you had of Dorothea Lang, which she had in her own handwriting. And it was about the young Mexican American boys, a future voter. And mm -hmm. this person asked, was she directly or publicly involved in political activism at this time? Mm -hmm. uh, in comparison with Sherry's work on Sarah Bard Field, is there any evidence of Lang's views on or um, participating in the women's suffrage movement? It's a great question. Yeah, that's, that is a terrific question. She was absolutely sympathetic and I think would have seen her, would have called herself um, someone who was for women's rights. I don't know that she aligned herself with the suffragettes per se in an explicit way. Um, she was very sympathetic as were the Bohemians around her to the Sacco and Vanzetti case. So this is the first Red Scare. There are the Palmer raids that do hit San Francisco as well. So there's a, absolutely, she has a, a kind of political awakening in San Francisco. Um, she was not a communist, but she, she for sure had um, very progressive outlook on issues such as um, women's rights and racial 
racial politics as well. That particular picture you saw was taken during the depression. That's when she really becomes politically active. She's married at that point to Paul Schuster Taylor, who's a professor of labor economics at Berkeley. And her work becomes, you know, though she's working with the government and has to be careful, um, she is, she is absolutely thinking about equity and social justice as she's out in the fields of California, taking pictures of people she's not supposed to be taking pictures of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was, um, and when you talk about that, about taking pictures of people that you wouldn't necessarily think, um, there's actually a question that came into the chat box. So excuse me if I move over a little bit, but um, it's, this person said they were interested to hear about the Bohemian's interest in Chinatown and was wondering if either of our speakers could share any more about the way Chinatown, Orientalism, Buddhism, and actual Chinese Americans were a part of San Francisco Bohemian life or uh, anything to that impact. Sherry, did you, uh, did you find any connection with Chinatown? Well, Erskine was a great admirer of Asian art. And so his, he would go down to Chinatown looking for stuff to buy. And he became uh, very good friends with a couple of the, the merchants there, and, uh, and including a Japanese uh, man, a Shioto, who he helped during the World War II when the family was sent off to a, a camp in, in Arizona. So um, he was uh, saw, saw himself as a, sort of an expert on Asian art. It turned out he wasn't always quite so expert, but that's what drew him to Chinatown. But he would also bring these people to their home. So uh, there were no, no issues uh, as, as far as Sarah and Erskine were concerned about having um, Chinese people, Japanese people in their home. But, but again, except for that World War II experience, I never saw them really reaching out and addressing you know, Phelan, who actually was a friend of theirs, about mm -hmm. his horrendous uh, you know, anti-Asian um, position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting what's written in letters and what's what's not even touched upon. And speaking of which, somebody asked, um, where are the Erskine and Sarah letters housed? And what a great find that must have been. And what did you, was it like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was it surprising, just, not just to find them, I guess that was cataloged, but to find that many? Uh, to find their house? To find that many, sorry. When you went to the archives. Oh, I'm sorry. Expecting to find that, that meant th th those letters, the letters. Well, I have to, to explain it. How I found the letters was that I, wrote a book about army officers and Indians a long time ago. And I was interested in Erskine because he was such an unusual army officer. So I was doing research in his diaries and letters from the 1870s, but I, it was a huge archive. And I saw all these boxes um, of letters from this woman who I knew was not his wife. So I went <laughs> back years later and said, I you know, actually dipped into it because it was so interesting. I discovered this was this other affair that he'd had that lasted for so long. So I got into this project knowing how many letters there were. Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> you knew you had a lot of time. That was I good. knew it would take a lot of time to read them, right. Well, and speaking of research, actually, this one is for you, Jasmine. Uh, this is a three-parter. So are you ready? I don't know whether I'll break it up or not. What's <laughs> the most challenging and most inspiring aspects in writing The Bohemians? Oh, so we're taking it one part at a time. Yes, I think so, because actually I'm, either, I'm gonna forget if I go through all three. <laughs> <laughs> the challenging and most inspiring aspects. So it's, it is very challenging to write historical fiction that is, I mean, I wouldn't say it's rever it doesn't have a reverential attitude toward history, but I do want to make sure that I am, um, that it's a recognizable rendition of Lang's life, right? So anything I, I imagine has to fall um, within the realm of possibility in a sense. And that's, that is really tricky, getting, um, getting a version of the story that feels satisfying for a reader, but also is respectful. The historical record is tough. It's really tough. Um, and I think I'm ready for number two. <laughs> right. Um, that they really enjoyed the lyricism of your writing and how evocative it was. Um, has the style been organic for you or was it a result of your research in finding the right tone, atmosphere and voice of the place as in San Francisco in the 1920s? Did you literally have to almost transport yourself there to get, did that impact your tone of your novel? There might be something in the fact that, I mean, I'm, it's that backward glance and it might be an invitation to a certain kind of lyricism. I know that when I write essays that are set, you know, during, let's say it's a contemporary essay about my own life, I don't seem to write with that same, um, that same poetic way, okay. but 
what, one thing I would say is that Persian is my native language and I feel that my English always bears the imprint of the Persian. So it might be that the lyricism that you hear has to do with um, my first language embedded and imprinted on me. Mm -hmm. And the last thing, how did writing Bohemians change you personally and, prof and professionally? Wow. Uh, okay, these are really good questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, this is my first book set in America. I'd written about Iran previously, and I wasn't sure, I, I just didn't know, you know, it was, it, for, for me, it was quite a leap. So it was in some ways, after 40 years of living, I came to America as a child in this really extraordinary way that I'm just realizing at this moment is it was a way of planting my own flag in the soil. Writing about America and San Francisco bound me and it kind of gives me a sense of for sure an affinity that I didn't have before writing this book. Um, writing about a place weds you to it in a way that maybe nothing else can. So I think it made me a bit, it for sure made me more San Franciscan. Um, and I think in a wonderful way, it also made me American. Mm, that's very interesting. Sherry, I could almost ask the same of you writing this book, which is very different from the books that you've written in the past. Mm. That sort of changed you. Well, I don't know if it changed me, but I, um, I guess it's changed me in this respect. My other books are really more academically oriented, more designed to be read by scholars. But this was a book that I thought, given the narrative aspect of it, given the deep uh, archives, was something I was going to try to write for not just scholars, although I hope they'll look at it, but for um, just the general reader, whatever that means. I'm trying to reach um, a broader readership with this story because I think it's a really compelling one. You know, in part to give you a sense of what it was like to live at that time, but also what it's like to be a human being who marries the wrong person. And who's, you know, there's so many elements of the story that are still very modern and can really reach, uh, I think, into people's lives and, and touch them in a way that I think could be worthwhile for them to look at this and, and watch the mistakes that these people made as well as maybe the things they did right. So where I'm going with this is that's made me want to write another book that's, that's more about relationships and also um, uh, write a book, not so much for my scholarly colleagues anymore, but instead again for interested readers who um, want to know about the past, but in a more sort of personalized kind of way. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that you say that because the, I read a review where it said, Sherry Smith is a scholar whose books read like the best fiction. <laughs> well, that was that was kind. I mean, and I think that's kind, and they mean it. They say character driven and, and a page turner, and it's it sort of uh, makes me realize that we we sort of have these stereotypes of historical fiction and uh, and nonfiction that, but as you said, they both have their place because mm. if we only rely on what is in the record, we're missing so many stories. Yes. Um, right. Jasmine, what inspired you, though, in the beginning to sort of like seek out the story of, uh, of not just Dorothea Lang, but her assistant as well and follow that down a path? Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to write about San Francisco. I've long been entranced by the 20s. So almost like a director, I was scouting and looking for who would, who would make, um, well, actually, it's like who would make good company? Because when you're writing a book, you're going to be spending a lot of time with your characters. And so Dorothea Lange, I think the fact that she had had polio as a child, the fact that she was robbed in San Francisco, the fact that, I mean, there was so much about her personal story that really spoke to me. I think the part though about her Chinese American assistant, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to go too far with this, but there is something in me as an immigrant that's always thinking about the, sh the, the characters that are in the shadows. Yeah, the, the people whose lives are overlooked. Um, and, and it is, uh, it, it's probably where my where, where my heart lies is telling those kind of stories. And Dorothea Lange's assistant was that kind of figure who'd been lost to history and who could possibly only be restored through the imagination. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Because again, I read somewhere too that you said that you tried to do some research, but there's just, there's very little there apart from, you know, some documentation about the house that you showed us, you know, the Dr. Cameron house and things like that compared to uh, other 
people that, that you had, Sherry, where, where all their letters got kept and saved and are at the Huntington where anyone, if you, if you ask nicely, can go and see. <laughs> but, um, um, the, uh, you know, a lot of people were really interested in actually the homes the home, and asked, are the home and studio, this is for you, Sherry, still standing, the one in Los, Los Gatos? Yes, absolutely. Um, it was finished in, in 1925. And I think it's had, Sarah had to sell it in, 19, in the mid-50s. Erskine died in 1944. She stayed there another 10 years. And then she finally had to sell it. And there have been, I believe, three owners over the course of, of those years. And fairly recently, it was sold. Um, but while it was for sale, a friend of mine who teaches at UC Santa Cruz told me, hey, this house was for sale. Maybe you could see it. So I called the uh, realtor. I was living in Texas at the time. I thought, he's not going to let me do this. But he did. He let me come and see it. So I was able to see it. And uh, it was lovely. And um, I think somebody actually just saw it in the chat, chat box, put a link to uh, the uh, realtor's um, brochure <laughs> about it. So people can, can check it out and see. It, uh, it looks the same. I haven't seen it since the new owners have it, but uh, I, it was very familiar to me from the photographs that I had seen of it when I actually got to walk the grounds. There's something I think so important um, as a biographer, which I guess I've become for this book anyway, to try to walk the streets, mm. uh, to find where they lived, even if the house isn't there anymore. But boy, when the house is there, Oh, it's just really wonderful. And the same, the same, the San Francisco house. I was in San Francisco for a conference, and I said, "You know what? I'm going to go up to Broadway and Taylor and see what's up." And there was the house. And so I'm sitting on the stoop writing a note. I'm Sherry Smith. I'm writing about people who used to own this house. Um, I'd love to meet you sometime. And the person came right came out of the house at that time and had me go and let me come inside. So it was really. I was very lucky. Yeah, you have all this great luck with. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> uh, one person else, I'm not, not sure, but you probably know what this reference is due to. Did you come across Harry Anderson Laffler and his Telegraph Hill compound? Is that in connection to do with Sarah and Erskine? No, no, I don't think so. Okay, I think people are very interested. You know, when you have a building, and I this gives you to the monkey block, Jasmine, which is so sad that it's not still standing because you read about it. But uh, did you just sort of peruse a lot of photographs to get an idea of what it must have been like? You know, I did not find that many photographs, especially from the inside of the building. But I was able to go to the San Francisco Public Library, which has various documents, including the, I think, the, the deed to the original deed to <laughs> that building. That was um, fantastic. Yeah, which, you know, the, these kinds of, uh, these, these, moments of connection, of tactile even connection. Cherry's talking about walking the streets, um, you know, holding uh, a brochure, let's say, from Dorothea Lange's studios. I find these incredibly evocative. Um, any kind of moment where I feel myself in the presence or even just the atmosphere of these places is, is, is truly, you know, in incomparable. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, I'd sort of almost like to give a plug to some of the libraries and archives that collect and maintain collections such as this. You mentioned the Oakland Museum that has the Dorothea Lang collection. They have digitized a lot of them and we put our, the website where you can view them in the chat box. The Huntington that has the most incredible collections. Um, the SFPL, the History Center, which is up on the sixth floor and you can you can make an appointment. I think you have to now because of COVID, but you can go there and uh, for San Francisco history, it's an incredible place. And then also the California Historical Society. Our library is open by appointment only on Thursday and Friday afternoons and you can come in and you can find the topic of your next article or book or just interest. Um, Jasmine and Sherry, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate your time. And, uh, and it was just really wonderful to hear the stories of these incredible women and Erskine, the man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Francis. It was a delight to be with you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. And if you would like to pass on the recording of this, remember, it'll be up on the California Historical Society YouTube uh, probably by next week. Thank you all and good night. Good night. Good night.